Uh, we have people online and welcome to all those people online. Um, you haven't missed any of the meeting. I just started with acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, the Wurundjeri people, um, and we paid our respect to elders past, present and emerging. Also paid respect to two people who sadly passed away, but played a very pivotal role in the development of paradigm, that being Kevin Hollingsworth and also um, Professor Peter Ghosh. So with those acknowledgements, I also acknowledged um, the hard work of many of the Paradigm staff. Many of them are here today, uh, looking forward to meeting uh, investors. So please introduce yourself to the Paradigm staff for the circulating. Uh, I also uh, moved on to introducing the um, board of directors and I can see Donna's online. Um, so Dr. Donna Skerritt, um, based in New York, uh, can't travel to Australia at the moment. Um, so. Donna is attending virtually. Uh, Donna is executive director, and I introduce to my left non-executive director Amos Meltzer, and then to Amos's left um, Helen Fisher, also non-executive director. I mentioned that um, uh, John Gaffney has um, resigned, and he has moved on. Uh, John was with the company for nearly ten years, and as part of our corporate governance policy, um, we have to look at refreshing directors. Uh, when they get to a 10-year tenure. So John has moved on, and I did want to also acknowledge and thank him for his contribution over those 10 years. Um, also acknowledging contributions, um, I think most shareholders will know that we um, announced that uh, Helen Fisher, uh, Helen has a, a number of uh, important roles and is going to become very busy with a particular project. And Helen has um, also identified that uh, when the right replacement is found, Helen will step aside and um, relinquish her role as a non-executive director. Okay. I'd also um, like to introduce Abby McNish, my um, right-hand person um, who handles all of the, the financials and also all of the company secretary duties. And also welcome to Beverly Hutman. Beverly's going to be presenting today as well. So I'm going to give a short um, chairman's address, but I would like to say that um, as a substantial shareholder of Paradigm, I, I do understand that there is a lot of grief in relation to the current share price. Yeah. But I also believe that the current share price is not a reflection of the enormous value that we've built up over many years. So I understand the pain of a, a low share price we are working our very best to make sure that we can get the share price up and where it should be over the next uh, 12 months. But in terms of um, achievements over the last 12 months, I would like to just run through some of the major achievements that the, the company, particularly the, the Paradigm staff have achieved. In 2023, Paradigm delivered positive clinical data in both the osteoarthritis and the MPS programs. So those people new to the story, MPS is a rare genetic disorder, mucopolysaccharidosis, the full name abbreviated to MPS. You will hear it mentioned a few times today, but our lead program is osteoarthritis. So most of the um, discussions today will be about the osteoarthritis program. Um, osteoarthritis para 008, that was a phase two clinical study. I'm sure you saw the results that were announced about that. Um, but we saw that um, IPPS at two milligram per kilogram twice a week had sustained pain reducing effects for 12 months uh, versus placebo. So that was an amazing outcome. So one course of treatment and then pain relief for a period of 12 months. In addition to that, uh, we also had very significant changes in the synovial fluid biomarkers. And in addition to that, we also had cartilage thickness increasing in the PPS group versus the placebo. So that was the first time a company has ever published really the, the triple crown in relation to osteoarthritis trials. We had pain reduction that was durable for 12 months. We showed biomarkers in the synovial fluid that the joint with the fluid within inside the joint, all the disease biomarkers going down in the PPS group versus the placebo group, the biomarkers were going up indicating cartilage and other structural changes and then we had MRIs showing that we had very important uh, changes to the cartilage. In other words, the cartilage was getting thicker 
and regrowing in the PPS group versus placebo. So really amazing um, results. Yes, we did determine the, low, the lowest effective dose. Um, I'm pleased to report that we have 120 clinical trial sites activated in our phase three program around in seven countries. So we, we have a truly global presence in terms of clinical trials. Uh, we also completed the MPS1 open label clinical study that was um, completed and reported on and the NPS6 study, which is the double blind placebo controlled study, highly anticipated uh, for a lot of commercial companies that will be reading out in the next few days, top line results. Also in a very tough financial environment, we were able to um, raise $30 million. And again, thanks to all of the, the people involved, particularly Bell Potter, who was our, our lead manager on that particular uh, transaction. And um, obviously we were down to less than two quarters of cash. So we needed to do something in relation to uh, fixing the cash position. So we um, raised that money. Also, we have um, over the last few months been active talking to investors and we've listened to investors and we've heard you and we are refreshing the board. We are bringing more commercial business acumen onto the board and um, uh, you'll see those changes as we go through the next uh, few months. And also just to let you know that we have started the search, um, did start some time ago, the search for a non-executive chairperson. When that person is found, I will be um, stepping into the managing director role full time. So that is a, an issue that has been raised previously. It is being addressed. The challenge here is to really find the right person who's going to guide us in through the next two years, which are going to be critical for the development of the company. Uh, and on behalf of the Paradigm Board, I would like to thank all shareholders, uh, employees, commercial partners, including Ben A. Pharma Kim, and other stakeholders for their ongoing support of the company. Um, the agenda is going to be a, a brief company update. We're going to have three people presenting. So we're going to uh, myself do a few introductory slides I'm then going to pass over to Dr. Skerritt, who's going to take you through developments within the phase three clinical program of osteoarthritis. And also then Beverly Hutman is going to take us through the commercial development. Uh, Beverly's a, a global head of business development and Beverly will take us through the uh, commercial development and deals that we are looking to execute on in the next few months. And then we'll have a brief 15, 20 minute, no more questions in relation to the company update. But if you don't have any, we'll move on to the formal part of the business. So this is the uh, company update. There's a slide with the executive team. So this is the C-suite, uh, Dr. Skerritt, who's our chief medical officer, Dr. Ravi Krishnan, who's our chief scientific officer, and Abby McNish, who's our chief financial officer. I think the point from this slide is the huge amount of milestones that the company has achieved over the last few years. So this is really um, a, a testament to the, the hard work of all of the, uh, the Paradigm staff, um, showing that we've made significant milestones. And each of these by themselves should be value creating. Th these are filings with the FDA, the EMA, um, et cetera. Um, these are milestones in relation to concluding 600 subjects recruited into the stage one of the phase three clinical study, which we said would should be complete by June. It was complete in July. So we have um, been able to meet our milestones on, on time and largely on budget. But there's, there's a lot there. And I, I would hope, as I said before, um, the share price is depressed and we understand that and we're all upset with that share price, but the company continues to make very solid progress in terms of our, our pursuit of getting this particular product to market, um, starting with the FDA clearance. Okay, so some of the key milestones in the last 12 months. So we secured funding to advance uh, Paradigm's osteoarthritis program. So you'd all be aware that we did a capital raise in November 
um, that fund, funds the company through to um, the middle of calendar year 2025, which also coincides with our major time uh, milestone of the completion of the phase three clinical study. Para 008, which is the, uh, sorry, 002, which is the stage one of the phase three trial, we achieved 100% recruitment, 600 subjects recruited into the stage one of the pivotal study. We're also preparing the OA manuscript, uh, which will highlight the day 56, uh, which was pain and function at day 56, which is the same endpoint as our phase three clinical trial. That was statistically significant at day 56 in para 008 and also six months um, synovial fluid biomarkers, six months MRI, and then 12 months um, duration of, of re reduction in pain. So that is currently being written up and we intend to submit that for peer review and publication. Probably uh, depends on the, the journal, obviously, but we would hope that that would be published sometime in the first half of 2024. Uh, we also had very significant um, progress in terms of um, presentations to orthopedic conferences. So we had three presentations at the 2023 very prestigious ORSI World Congress on OA, and that was so important that we had a number of people from the audience today who also attended that meeting. And I think they would agree that um, it was a very successful meeting and really raised the profile of paradigm with people within the field of osteoarthritis. We got a lot of questions and we had a lot of interest and we also got a lot of um, physicians who were also attending that meeting saying that they wanted to become a clinical trial center for our phase three clinical study. So that was um, very successful. And just this month, we had two posters uh, approved for, again, another very prestigious uh, conference in the United States being the American College of Rheumatology. Um, we, we had two studies, one on the 008 data and one on the K9 data, um, both showing very promising disease modifying effects of the drug. Again, highly um, visible and a lot of people attending, a lot of questions from that meeting as well. So it was very, um, very beneficial for Paradigm. Um, also, um, in the last 12 months, we worked out a number of activities to really um, accelerate our phase three clinical trial recruitment. So there are a number of strategies that we put in place that were able to see our recruitment rates increase significantly. And a lot of those um, were really ideas that came from uh, people within the company, um, our clinical team, obviously, but we found ways to really accelerate our clinical trial um, recruitment, which of course is the key driver to when the clinical trial will finish. If you recruit slowly, the trial takes longer, the reverse occurs. So we were very happy to see many people coming into the clinical trial. And those initiatives are in place and often they are initiatives that Paradigm has initiated and we'll be uh, rolling those out when we get started on stage two of the phase three clinical study. Uh, in terms of commercial transactions, um, as I said, my colleague Beverly is going to take you through more detail about that, but I can say that we did receive a binding offer for a regional license deal in MPS, but ultimately the Paradigm Board rejected the deal. It wasn't a deal that we would um, consider to be value creating. Um, it was uh, a low base offer. Um, we decided to um, walk away from that deal um, and reassess and we've made some changes um, but that was um, an indication that companies are interested in the um, programs that we are working on and again as I said Beverly will take you through more detail of what's happening so uh, now we're going to pause and we're going to talk about osteoarthritis the phase three clinical program and at this point I'm going to hand over to Dr Skerritt and she's going to take you through development and advancement in the uh, phase three clinical study. Thank you, Paul. So I'll start with an update on the osteoarthritis program. If I may have the next slide, please. Thank you. So as you've heard, we've had a number of achievements in our clinical program in the past year. The PARA-002 uh, stage one 
of the phase three program completed 100% recruitment, 600 patients were randomized into that stage. We then conducted an interim analysis. Uh, uh, it was conducted, designed by us and conducted by our DMC on the first 300 participants. And the goal of that interim analysis was to identify the minimum effective dose of, of PPS. We wanted to know if um, the dose in, within the study were performing as well as the dose of two milligrams for kg twice weekly. And as a result of that pre-specified analysis, we did determine that the two milligram per kg twice weekly dose is the optimal dose to progress into the next stage of our pivotal um, and confirmatory phase three program. Additionally, our data monitoring committee met uh, twice for formal safety reviews, which were conducted for that study 002, first in December of 2022, and then again in June, and at those times recommended the trial proceed without modification. At the time of the interim analysis for dose evaluation, uh, safety analysis was conducted then and no new safety signals were identified. As I mentioned, uh, at that interim analysis, we did make the determination to move forward with the dose of two milligrams per kg twice weekly. We undertook a number of activities in order to accelerate uh, recruitment in this program. We launched a dedicated phase three clinical trial website called hope4oa.com. We activated an additional 40 clinical sites to the initial planned 80. So we had 120 sites enrolling patients across seven countries. So a very active study, seven countries. We introduced one in health and subject well recruitment initiatives to help funnel patients into the sites to keep uh, recruitment uh, um, moving uh, throughout the study. And then very importantly, we developed an alliance with the NFL Alumni Health Research Partnership. This is a formal partnership that um, was initiated through our, um, the experience some NFL alumni members had in the EAP program. And through this partnership, we now have outreach into the many NFL alumni clubs to inform uh, alumni about the activities of our company and importantly, the opportunities for interest in our phase three program in osteoarthritis. Next slide, please. So importantly, we established the optimal dose for our program. We have extensive clinical experience with the dose of two milligrams per kg twice weekly. That experience came from our first uh, clinical trial on osteoarthritis of the knee, para 005, which evaluated 121 participants. This was a randomized controlled trial. And then uh, we went on to conduct para 008, 61 participants in that trial, also a randomized controlled trial. And then through our TGA special access scheme program, we have treated over 600 patients. And then in the US, the FDA expanded access program uh, treated 10 ex-NFL players, all of them with this dose of two milligrams per kg twice weekly. Uh, when we first went in to talk with the regulators about initiating our phase three programs and questions were asked about whether we were working with the minimal effective dose. And for that reason, we agreed to put a dose finding arm into the first stage of our phase three program. Uh, we did establish through that first stage that the optimal dose for proceeding is a dose that we have the most experience. We also in this year completed three non-clinical toxicology studies. Uh, they started at the beginning of PARA002 uh, to evaluate adrenal uh, findings that were seen in the non-clinical IND enabling studies. And those studies have concluded that there are no adverse adrenal toxicity events at the optimal dose of two milligrams per kg twice weekly. So as I mentioned, the program will proceed with a dose of uh, two milligrams twice weekly for further development based on the above clinical experience and the dose finding results. Next slide, please. Thank you. So other important uh, findings in the past year, 
um, were obtained from the PARA-008 study. So I mentioned this is a study of 61 patients that was designed to explore the durable effects of PPS on pain, function, and osteoarthritis disease progression. The study firstly wanted to look at biomarkers and determine uh, what we could understand about the mechanism of action of PPS and uh, evaluate this by looking at the synovial fluid of patients who receive PPS either once or twice weekly, compare that to placebo, and get an understanding of how PPS, which is delivered systemically, was um, uh, impacting uh, biomarkers and disease processes within the uh, index knee. The follow-up period of the study is out to 12 months. And we have reported previously on some outstanding top-line results in this program. First of all, the primary endpoint was achieved, and that was to identify one or more synovial fluid biomarkers associated with osteoarthritis disease progression at day 56. And as previously reported, we actually identified several synovial fluid biomarkers at day 56, reflecting um, inflammatory processes, pain, as well as um, uh, disease progression markers. So we showed decreases in biomarkers of disease progression as well. Additionally, we showed at day 56 statistically significant improvements in pain and joint function as measured um, by the WOMAC pain scales. And this represents the primary endpoint of the phase three osteoarthritis program. When we followed the patients out to 12 months, we saw that they sustained significant improvement in pain, function, stiffness, and overall OMAC scores for the twice weekly uh, treated group compared to placebo arm. We then at six months looked at uh, structural changes by evaluating MRI analysis. We repeated out previously on the semi-quantitative or worms analysis of the knees. Uh, we subsequently followed up with the quantitative MRI analysis, which was reported out for day 168 uh, assessments. And this analysis showed increased cartilage thickness and volume indicating cartilage preservation, reduction of bone marrow lesions, and reductions of synovitis of the inflammatory response that occurs in osteoarthritis of the knee. So importantly, we're showing here both clinical, uh, mechanistic, as well as structural benefits from a single six-week treatment course of PPS given twice weekly. Next slide, please. So to look at this um, from a, a very uh, high view on, uh, we can conclude here that PPS has now demonstrated efficacy on both objective and subjective measures compared to placebo. The objective measures that we've reported out are the improvement in synovial fluid biomarkers associated with osteoarthritis disease progression. And these uh, markers of, pro uh, of uh, uh, progression uh, have been shown at day 56 and day 168. So we're seeing that PPS has an effect on inflammatory markers, pain, and disease progression at these two time points. Then we've also seen uh, that uh, there is improvement in structural changes in the knee as determined by quantitative MRI at day 168. So this is a single course, and now we're seeing the objective data measures out to day 168. Additionally, we've uh, demonstrated in this controlled trial significant improvement in the mean change from baseline in WOMAC pain function and WOMAC scores overall at day 56, day 168, and day 365. So this is now at one year, we're seeing significant improvement in pain and function. And this also correlated with a significant improvement in PGIC, which is a patient global impression of change. So it's a, a patient-based outcome measure uh, that is uh, very highly regarded in terms of patient outcome assessments for osteoarthritis. So these are showing us now that out to a year, 
we're seeing clinical improvement from the single six-week course of twice-weekly administered drug. Next slide, please. So taken together, we have uh, several key milestones for fiscal year 24. We have um, protocol development for the next stage of phase three. So we're developing this protocol now with the two milligram twice weekly dose uh, compared to a placebo arm. We expect the trial numbers in this uh, phase of the study to remain approximately 600 participants. And this uh, protocol will be submitted to the FDA for review the first quarter of calendar year 24. Uh, we will also move forward with our TGA provisional approval application. Uh, this application will be uh, comprised of our clinical development plan, uh, our data as uh, being uh, put together for the 008 manuscript, and also a literature comparison manuscript, which looks at uh, other OA treatments available now and will uh, compare the uh, effects and the duration and the range of um, outcomes in PPS versus available pharmacologic therapies in Australia. The next uh, milestone for us in this fiscal year will be the commencement of enrollment in the phase three program. We have uh, a large number of sites that were activated for the first stage who remain interested in participating in the next stage. And we will continue to use those very uh, successful recruitment initiatives in order to keep the trial um, uh, actively enrolling on a uh, very rigorous timeline. Next slide, please. So I'd like to share a few words also about our MPS uh, program. Next slide. As you've heard, MPS or mucopolysaccharidosis is a rare pediatric disease uh, for which we have established uh, orphan designation and the uh, US under the FDA and also in Europe under EMA. We've conducted two uh, trials in MPS. The first, MPS-1, is an open label trial which evaluated patients in Australia. They were treated weekly for 12 weeks and then every other week out to a total of 52 weeks. We've um, reported on the interim top line data. PPS was well tolerated and demonstrated reductions in pain and the gag uh, accumulations in the joints, which are associated with inflammation. Um, and so we saw improvement in, fun in function due to reductions in the gags. Uh, we also followed uh, biomarker profiles and showed changes in these profiles at 49 and 73 weeks with PPS treatment. And this suggests that PPS has the potential to modulate the biomarkers that are associated with joint degeneration and arthralgia in these patients. Now, I'll mention that these patients uh, have already received primary treatment for their disease. So with MPS1 patients, they have uh, had severe disease diagnosed early on in life, and so they've undergone a bone marrow transplant, which is a life-saving procedure for them, but they have residual musculoskeletal uh, pain and difficulty with functioning. The MPS6 trial, which is completed enrollment, is a double-blind placebo control trial of 13 participants. They were dosed weekly for 24 weeks. The primary endpoint in the study is safety, but key secondary endpoints are clinical endpoints of pain and function. Our principal investigator, Dr. Roberto Giuliani, uh, conducted the study at two sites in Brazil, and he is a leading uh, expert on MPS in the uh, Latin American region, as well as globally. The trial is a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. Uh, these types of data are very rare in orphan uh, disease. And for that reason, this uh, indication and these data are attractive to pharma companies as um, the orphan diseases uh, often have uh, more reduced requirements for uh, marketing. Uh, patients are well known to the physicians because they're currently on uh, primary treatment, in this case, uh, enzyme replacement therapy, and um, there would be a higher penetration rate expected due to the small community of patients in um, these indications and the highly engaged patient advocacy groups. 
groups, we've had reach out um, from physicians, from companies, and from patient advocacy groups because uh, the community in orphan indications is, is quite small. So uh, next slide, please. So our focus areas for the MPS program in the fiscal year of 24 are the following. Completion of the two phase two studies in MPS one and six um, mean that Paradigm's clinical expenditure has concluded with this rare disease program. We will now focus on the readout of the top line MPS six data, the potential for expedited or provisional approval submissions in uh, both Brazil and Australia, continued discussions with uh, potential partnering companies to progress this rare disease asset through to commercialization, as well as um, manuscript for peer review publication of MPS 1 and 6. Next slide, please. And obviously, these goals that I've described uh, require uh, a good deal of collaboration with our regulatory team. We are uh, very fortunate to have a skilled uh, regulatory team that works with us on all aspects needed to advance our program. And so, as I've mentioned, uh, we will work to um, move forward with our provisional approval application uh, with the TGA. We will have a type D meeting with the FDA uh, first quarter of 24 to uh, review the non-clinical adrenal uh, data as well as the clinical data that we've acquired on adrenal function. We will move forward in the first quarter with a protocol review for the next stage of the phase three OA program. We have other meetings planned to evaluate uh, the biomarker data with uh, regulatory reviewers to establish the pathway forward for that indication. And then for MPS, we will have meetings to evaluate the uh, TGA potential for uh, provisional approval for that indication. And then in Brazil, we plan an end of phase meeting to look at the uh, data with the Brazilian regulatory authorities and visa, and also to uh, talk about the registration pathway for MPS in Brazil. Next slide, please. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Beverly Hutman, who will uh, talk to us further about the company update. Thank you, Donna. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to share with you our partnering strategy and our progress with partnering. The goal of our partnering activities is to monetize our clinical stage assets to secure the best value for our shareholders. Now, we're flexible about the geographic territory a company may partner. For example, MPS is likely to be a regional deal because the prevalence of this ultra rare disease is concentrated in the Middle East and Latin America. So companies in these regions are, there, are assessing both OA, osteoarthritis and mucopolysaccharidosis. On the other hand, in China, the opportunity is more for OA. And so we are focusing on osteoarthritis in China. And I'll talk a little bit more later about why we have prioritized partnering in China. We are also pursuing other regions, for example, the US and Europe, where we know companies are watching our development program and our news flow with increasing interest. In addition to Paradigm's attendance at partnering meetings, we have secured the services of licensing consultants to help us manage the process and negotiate with potential partners. Plexus Ventures are a global consultancy with more than 30 years experience in licensing pharmaceuticals. Many of the Plexus uh, personnel have prior licensing experience at a senior level from within Big Pharma. Plexus are representing us globally with the exception of China. In China, we have um, employed Yafo Capital. They're a China-based consultancy and they're well experienced in the OA space, having secured the deal between Hysco and Biosplice for Laura Sivivin some years ago. 
Now, the assessment of an asset for in licensing is a resource intensive activity for potential partners. It requires a thorough review of all available information and often involves nearly every department of the company before they reach a decision to proceed to an offer. And often they will choose to wait for imminent data to be released before continuing with their assessment. And this has been the case with companies interested in OA, particularly in the US, where the recent release of the positive 12-month clinical data and six-month quantitative MRA data created heightened interest. And we've also brought in, on the back of that data, new companies to the table. This is a positive for shareholders as it creates a competitive environment for securing the best terms for partnering this asset. The data from the recently completed MPS6 study will be available shortly, and this is expected to be a key data point to continue negotiations with the companies that are interested in MPS. We are confident our partnering efforts will be successful in one or more regions by the end of June 2024, and I will talk about our progress a little later on. So let's have a look at China. China has not traditionally been a pharmaceutical market that companies prioritize early in their commercialization strategies. However, recent changes to the pharmaceutical regulatory environment in China and changes to the demographics of China have changed the way pharmaceutical companies view partnering in this country. Firstly, the opportunity in China, as you can see here, is the largest in the world. And this is assuming a lower dollar value in China per dose than for instance, in the US. Secondly, 70% of the nation's 1.4 billion population is comprised of middle-class employed urban professional people. Furthermore, there's a healthy non-government funded pharmaceutical sector with a good proportion of drug purchases funded either fully or partially by either the private health insurance or by the patient or the patient's carers. Finally, the pharmaceutical sector in China has evolved over the last few years. In the past, new drugs were required to undergo specific clinical trials in China, which delayed access to the market. Whereas now global trials Inc may include a subset of ethnic Chinese participants, and these will be accepted by the regulator. This allows faster access to the Chinese market. Other changes include a higher acceptance of imported products than in the past, and registration in China no longer requires prior registration in other key markets. As a result, many companies now consider China a key part of their global commercialization strategy. So now let's have a look at the steps organizations go through to proceed to a deal. As I said, it is a resource intensive undertaking for companies, particularly where there's some financial risk for them in the form of pre-launch milestone payments. After a company has expressed initial interest and signed a confidentiality agreement, we share a document containing sufficient detailed information for them to conduct a thorough assessment of the product in order to prepare a business case and propose non-binding terms. This is the most resource intensive part of the process. There may be many rounds of questions, further exchange of information and discussions of draft terms between the two parties. We currently have multiple companies at this stage in China, the Middle East and Latin America, creating competitive tension, which may help us to secure the best terms possible. Once both parties reach agreement on the business case and the non-binding terms, the potential partners are given access to the data room to validate the information and the assumptions in their business case. In this way, we limit access to our confidential documents 
to those companies who are serious about licensing the product, who have the capabilities to commercialise it, and who have shown willingness to engage under terms that are acceptable to us. Now, once the company has validated their business case, we can then proceed to a binding offer and final negotiation of terms. Many companies are currently reviewing the confidential information across a number of regions. And as I said, we are confident that at least one of these will proceed to a deal by the end of June next year. I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll now hand over to our CFO, Abby McNeish, for the financial update. Thanks, Beverly. So just a quick one for me, um, an update on our funding position after the capital raise. So we recently raised approximately $30 million um, to fund the company through to mid-2025 without additional licensing revenue that Beverly's just provided an update on. Um, that provides the company, so as at the 30th of September 2023, our quarterly cash flow, plus the uh, funds that we've just received, the $30 million, plus the R&D refund provision. Um, that gives us a pro, pro forma cash balance currently of 69.4, so just under $70 million at the time of the raise. Now, the raise included a very strategic short-term option placement um, with an exercise price of $0.65. Cents, and the assumption of the price um, going through that level in by November 2024 and therefore the options being exercised, that will include an additional funding of $33.8 million to the company, um, which will take us at current, current um, time just over $100 million in pro forma cash balance. Um, there are also, as you've heard from Beverly, potential partnering deals along the way to provide material additional non-dilutive cash runway for the company. And additionally, we have implemented quite a few cost reduction strategies. We've begun that over the last six months and we continue to do so to ensure that our capital spend is entirely focused on progressing the OA program through stage two of the phase three program. So what I'll do now is hand over to Paul to wrap up and head into the formal part of the meeting. Well, thank you very much, Abby. And also thank you, Beverly. That was a fantastic summary of our uh, commercial transaction pipeline. And obviously, um, as Beverly said, we are very confident that we will bring a deal home by June 2024. And I'm sure if we don't, there'll be plenty of people in the audience who will remind me at the next AGM. So the pressure is on, the pressure is on, we understand that, but we want a deal more than you can imagine, more than what investors want. We want to be able to get commercial companies seeing exactly what we're seeing in terms of the, the tremendous value that this brings to the, the market of treating osteoarthritis. Um, also, thank you to Donna. Um, that was a great summary of where we are with our phase three clinical program. And um, I'm now just going to touch on um, a few outcomes for financial year 2024. So again, this is uh, on, on the screen. Um, phase three osteoarthritis program protocol acceptance from the US FDA for progression with the lowest effective dose, two milligram per kilogram twice weekly. So as you heard from Dr. Skerritt, um, our regulatory team is preparing to make a submission to the FDA with the revised protocol being the two milligram per kilogram twice weekly, um, making that submission in Q1 of calendar year 2024. With that, I might um, just highlight that um, our global head of reg affairs, uh, Dr. Carla Noah is uh, sitting just in front of the first screen. And um, Carla is uh, working with her team um, who are um, at the back of the room. There's Celine. There's Kate, there's Britta, all in the regulatory department. If you want to have any um, discussions with them about the filing with the FDA and things like that, I'm sure those ladies would be more than happy to take your questions. Sorry, ladies, but I'm sure you will. Thank you. <laughs> um, the, the, the reg team have a very big job on their hands um, this year. So the reg team is focusing on making that submission to the FDA for our phase three program. But also what they're doing is they're making submissions to the TGA for our provisional approval. And that um, is going to start as of January, I believe, how we make our submission to the TGA for the osteoarthritis provisional submission. And what the TGA asked us from their last meeting with them is they wanted to know what was the duration of effect of the drug. 
and we told them that we had anecdotal evidence from over 800 subjects treated through the special access scheme uh, that duration was roughly 12 months and the TGA said well we want controlled data we want to see that data versus placebo and now we have that data as a result of para 008 and we're looking forward to presenting that to the the TGA in in January As Beverly put it very nicely, a regional licensing agreement in osteoarthritis and or MPS um, is likely given the tremendous amount of activity that we have going on. And Beverly and I speak once a day, twice a day. Beverly is sick and tired of me calling her asking for a deal. So if there's anyone in the room who wants a deal, it's Beverly. And she's highly motivated and she's gonna get the deal. I'm sure you enjoy my phone calls, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so um, the pivotal study will recommence um, recruitment after we have the protocol approved through the um, FDA um, middle of next year. And as I said, we're expecting fast recruitment given the fact that we have many of the initiatives that we implemented in the uh, stage one the One End Health, the NFL alumni, et cetera, et cetera. All of those initiatives are still at our disposal to crank up recruitment and get that uh, phase three, stage two finished by June, 2025. And we will have um, obviously a number of peer review publications as outlined in the presentations that will be submitted and hopefully published. Um, we'll also have um, hopefully some news around filing our, our full submission with the, the TGA, which we hope will be around the middle of calendar year 2024. And then hopefully, um, if all goes well with the TGA, um, approval um, around June, July 2025, the same time as our phase three um, clinical trial in the United States and other countries finishes. Next slide. Okay, so um, on this particular slide, um, we have our key milestones for the next 18 months. And as you can see, we've broken them down into milestones for the first half of calendar year 2024. And dropping down to the bottom of that list is a regional licensing agreement in OA and or NPS. Um, we also have um, milestones for the second half of calendar year 2024. And so again, we've outlined those, but I think the big one that everyone is really focusing on is um, in calendar year 2025, first half, there is only one milestone that we are interested in. And that is the 100% recruitment of our pivotal phase three study. So that is what we are working towards. And that is what, um, drives us every day we get to work. We're putting things in place to make sure that we finish that phase three program. In terms of other thank yous, I'd like to thank um, Donna for staying up late um, in New York with her presentation. Uh, thank you to Beverly for um, presenting the, the business development. Uh, thank you to Simon and Abby who've worked tirelessly behind the scenes to put all of the mechanics together to make the numbers uh, work and uh, checked and double checked. So a lot of work goes into that. And so thank you very much, Abby and Simon for pulling all that together. Thank you to the Paradigm staff who um, attended today. Appreciate your support. Um, most importantly, thank you to all the shareholders for visiting us today and giving us the opportunity to present to you the 2023 uh, AGM uh, resolutions and presentation company update. I'll close the meeting and say again to everyone, thank you so much for coming. It's been our pleasure to welcome you to the AGM and we look forward to seeing you next year.